<clears throat> All right, well, <clears throat> welcome to week five. Good news, we're not playing catch-up anymore. Uh, bad news, this is one of the lecture topics that usually people struggle with the most, which is good that we're not trying to catch up anymore. Um, so today I'm going to go through the presentation as given to me. I'm still waiting to get a draft of the midterm. That's why you guys haven't gotten more details about the midterm yet, because I've been waiting to get a copy of the draft. Which is fine. I was as pro was promised to me at the end of this week, so we'll go with it. It's still going to be during class. And um, whether it's on paper or whether it's on Brightspace, I'm a little bit in the dark over at the moment. There was a lot of bickering amongst all the full-time profs over that particular topic about two weeks ago. I decided to just be quiet and wait to see which way it goes because I'm going to get outvoted no matter which way I choose. So we're going to go with that. Um, now. If you have Cal accommodations for extra time, go book your Cal time. Because it's very difficult to give extra time in class if there's another class coming in behind us. I don't know if there is or not, but there's been students come in after my lecture is done that don't belong to me, which makes me suspect that there's probably a class after ours, even if it's a half hour delay between classes. If you get extra time, you may not get your extra time unless you write in Cal. Just putting it out there. Um, over the summer, it was our first time we had everybody back in, in person, and it was a, um, pardon the phrase, a shit show. Uh, apparently, people didn't understand that if you want extra time, you actually have to book with Cal and write in Cal. Uh, it was a terrible way for people to find out that they weren't getting extra time on their final exam because there was another class behind us in the gym. So, this is my first warning about Cal. If you, have, if you have access to it, use it and book your time appropriately. Uh, the midterm will be during the regularly scheduled class time, so two Tuesdays from now. Uh, let's see, what other housekeeping do I have to get out of the way? Uh, if you formed groups for the assignment and you have not emailed them to me, email them to me, otherwise you will not have anywhere to submit said assignment. Because you can't see the submission spot unless you are in a group. As in, in a group in Brightspace. Not, you know, oh, I've got a group partner and then it's, you know, 11.58 uh, p.m. on Saturday night. Do you think Dan's going to be watching his email before you get cut off? No. I'll probably be asleep. Um, I'm getting older. It's really hard to get past 11.30 at night. Considering I wake up at stupid hours now, it sucks. Um, that's piece of housekeeping number two. Um, I did put this in the announcement, but in case people don't read announcements, because historically, uh, maybe one out of every 25 students actually reads the announcements, you must demonstrate your, your assignment to me. Bring your lab period. Now, if your partner is in a different lab period, that is cool, as long as you can find a lab period that works for both of you. Do you have to show up with your group members? If, for whatever reason, your group member cannot make it, please let me know so I can make appropriate accommodations. It's more of a sanity check on my part than anything else, because it's not like programming where you have to hit the right and run button and shit happens or doesn't happen, as the case may be. Um, however, I am going to ask various questions about why did you choose to do this or why didn't you know why is it like that or that kind of stuff normally it takes under five minutes it's not the end of the world it's just our way to make sure that you aren't grabbing somebody else's assignment slapping your name on it and saying i made this um historically that kind of stuff was rampant and it's been getting worse over the last 10 years i'm not even going to blame covid on this one I actually had more unique submissions via COVID, during COVID than I had before COVID. So the demonstration is for you to at least, you know, make a semblance of, yeah, I made this. If I ask you a question about why is this table like this? And you go, I don't know what that table's for. That's not a good look. So the last week before 
the break. That's what the labs are for, is for doing the demos. Uh, once the demos are all done, and if you have questions about whatever lab work is left, cool. But demos will come first. So what am I doing next week if I'm caught up? Because technically there's five lectures. We had a gap week, and then we have the midterm. Uh, next week, I will be going through the entire design process from start to end, from a block of text all the way to a physical diagram. And then there might, then I'm also going to cover at the beginning of the lecture, you know, there's so many questions on this topic and there's so many questions on that topic. I don't do formalized reviews because, golly gee, I record my lectures. I'm not a fan of um, trying to cram five weeks worth of material in 45 minutes. Uh, it's a waste of time and a waste of energy for everybody. But I will be giving you guys the breakdown of, you know, so many questions from sl slide deck one, so many questions from slide deck two kind of thing. Uh, the biggest challenge I'm going to have between now and then is finding out how to put up the screen. I can't find the button. There used to be a nice button. See that metal plate right there next, next to the little roll around whiteboard? That's where the up down button used to be for the screen. Um, I'm figuring it's somewhere on that touch screen that has no button for screen. So, you know, I'm going to be sending out a message to 5555 at Algonquin and ask them how they can get the screen up in this room. Um, okay, so that's all the housekeeping done up front. I will now hopefully be able to turn on the projector. How many presses do you think this is going to take? Oh, two. Yes. Potentially. Like I said, I don't have the draft of the midterm yet. So I cannot 100% guarantee what is and is not on there, which is why I will be going over it next week. However, you should be doing your hybrids because you do actually have deadlines on them. So, yeah, you should really get the, those hybrids done. There's four slide decks you got to peruse, two for each one. And I think the first one's already done and gone. So, and if it's not, it will be shortly. Yes. Don't even worry about the word midterm here. That's from last term, 22S. Oh, look at that. Do October 21st, boop. What is October 21st? That makes complete sense. All right, fantastic. Okay, so that was good to get that out of the way. Thank you for reminding me about that because I would have forgotten about it to make the uh, make it visible to people button. All right, so yes, hybrid one is done and gone. If you didn't do it, well, that's TFB. Um, Hybrid two is going to be due just before the break. But by then, your assignment will be in. Your midterm will be done. So that means you got like, and you're you only got one lab left to work on. And theoretically, should have it done by then because it's being handed out probably this week. <laughs> so you have a couple of weeks to work on that lab. Yes, it's crunch time, and there's a big pile of crap for you guys to do. Welcome to college. Um, it was pretty much the same when I went through college. Except we didn't have something nice like Brightspace to remind us of everything we had to do. And assignments were due Monday morning at 7 a.m. You walked into the school and you dropped a floppy disk into a box. That's how you submitted your assignments. Or you dropped off your printed out, if you're lucky enough to actually own a printer, printed out copy of your assignment for writing classes into the appropriate submission box. And that's how stuff happened. So it was really rough. Okay, so what are we covering today now that we're diving into actual new material? Uh, or I should say now that we've done all our housekeeping. We're going to talk about normalization. And there's a bunch of lesson, lesson objectives here. Um, the normalization examples, I'm going to, I got to word this properly. 
skip for today because I'm going to be doing a complete top to bottom example next week of the whole normalization down to a diagram. So you'll get the, the entire experience. So I won't be doing that at the end of today. Yes. This is week five. Hey, it's not showing. Uh, thank you. And I bet you it's another one of those. Where the hell is it? Here. Oh, look at that. Now it's not hidden. Oh, you know what? Week six won't be hidden either, but there's no content on week six. And yeah. Their reading week's not hidden either. Week seven is staying put because I don't know what's happening with the midterm yet. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for uh, calling me out. I actually don't get offended by that. Okay. So today is going to be an info dump. There's going to be a shit ton of terminology. Just to say this is how you make a good database. Um, normalization is a topic that a lot of database profs get really, really excited about. Um, it is what it is. So with normalization, it's not something normally you do as, you, as soon as you leave school. It's something you do once you've got a bit of experience under your belt. Uh, odds are you're going to be doing it once your uh, future employer deems you not a danger to yourself or them. And it's something that doesn't happen as much as it used to. But it's still an important topic because you need to understand the concepts. Because even if you're starting a database from scratch, you have to understand these concepts. A common way of dealing with this is you're going to receive basically an Excel spreadsheet full of crap. And it turn that noise into a functional set of tables. And there's a scenario question here is, should the data be stored as it received or should it be transformed before storage? I think it's like a leading question as in, yeah, you don't store it the way you got it. Okay, if it's coming at you as an Excel spreadsheet or as a report output or an HTML table, a CSV file, take your pick. It's probably not going to be the way you want to store it unless it's already normalized. And based on this lecture, it's not normalized. So database normalization is the process used to organize a database into tables and columns. The idea is a table should be only about a specific topic. So when you're creating a database and you create a table in that database, or you're defining an entity for you know conceptual diagramming, that table or entity should only ever be about one thing. Be it a customer, an order, a class, as in for a course, not like a Java class. It should be about only one thing. And the columns and or attributes contained therein should only pertain to that one thing. For example, I create an entity for students did not include course description as an attribute for a student because it has nothing to do with the student. That attribute slash column would have nothing to do with the student, therefore it doesn't belong there. And the example they're giving us that their spreadsheet contains stuff about salespeople, uh, customers, and identify which people call on specific customers. Um, I've seen, we used to have something like that at my day job years and years ago, essentially uh, regional breakdowns, you know, region east, these resellers were assigned to sales rep A, region west, these resellers were assigned to sales rep B. Uh, anybody else in North America, including Canada and Mexico, and apparently Puerto Rico, would go to sales rep C. 
We didn't deal with the international because that was the European office. But it was literally just a spreadsheet of Kevin deals with trim line. Mel deals with you know, whatever other company. It was a mess. I've actually seen this exact example in practice. So essentially, it's just a big giant spreadsheet going down. It was a terrible thing. So when you limit a table to one purpose, you reduce the amount of duplicated data in your database. So that's item number two of why you want to normalize is to reduce duplicated data. Which if you're reducing duplicated data or hopefully eliminating duplicated data, it gets rid of some of the issues that come from updating data, inserting data, deleting data. You want to touch data in as few places as possible. So in order to achieve these goals, some basic rules were defined to help organize that, and it, they're known as the normal forms. So the process of organizing jumbled up data into something reasonable is called normalization because you're stepping through the various normal forms. And as all things in the world, not all relations are made equal. Some are easy to process. Some are really problematic. And the different normal forms are categorized based on the kind of problems they introduce. So knowing how the normal forms work and how they're used will help you guys create an appropriate database designs in the future. It also make you maybe understand why a senior database designer will make certain decisions about the database. And you'll be looking going, why the heck would you do that? Like, why would you create another table just for this? You just shove it in the first table. There's a reason for that. And hopefully it'll be kind of clear by the end of today, or if not, it'll at least be clear by the end of next week. So there are three normal forms that are adhered by most database systems and most database designers. There are actually tons of normal forms past that, but after the fourth, sorry, there's a middle, there's a normal form between three and four. And once you get past that one, it rarely it's for edge cases and or academic purposes. So there's the, what are the first three normal forms called? First normal form, second normal form, and third normal form. They're not hard to remember. Maybe the definition of what defines them is a little hard to remember, but they're literally called first, second, and third. The one between three and four is called voice cod. And then there's fourth, fifth, sixth. And then there's actually some more past that. So, First normal form is to minimize duplicated data. So you're going to get rid of duplicated data. The second is to minimize or avoid data modification and issues. And the third is to simplify. So given a table like this, which is that sales staff example we had, where we had the employee information, the salesperson, a sales office, an office number, a customer, a customer, and a customer. This table has many issues. Now, when you look at this table for starters, you'll see that the primary key is underlined. And what's happening here is not all the columns are being filled in. Um, as you can see, the Chicago office is actually duplicated. Um, you know, and then you got customers in various columns and they're not properly listed, they're just there. So when we look at this table, there's it, the primary key is underlined. I already said that. It, it it serves multiple purposes. It identifies the salespeople. Right? This batch right there. It identifies the sales offices and the phone numbers. This block right here. And then it associates the sales rep to the sales office, and it shows each of the salesperson's customers. This table is great. It does all kinds of things. And by great, I'm being really sarcastic. 
It's like I'm it's like me calling Tim Horn's coffee great. It's not. It introduces data duplication. For example, Chicago is in there twice. It brings in update issues. If we need to change Chicago, the phone number Chicago, we got to update in multiple places. That's not good. Com modern computer systems are nice and quick. Might not have that many problems. But back in the day when computers were slow, it, things happened. Yeah, that's part of the normalization process. And then it makes it difficult to query data because we don't know how this stuff is stored. So that means we need to pull all these, et cetera, et cetera. It makes things hard. So there is a couple different kinds of anomalies. Um, basically, things that cause problems are known as anomalies. And data duplication anomaly and a modification anomaly. So duplicated information represents two problems. It increases storage and decreases performance. In other words, if you keep copying the same thing over and over and over, and it's going to take up more room. Yes, today's computers have big fat hard drives. It's not really that much of an issue. But it's still a problem. Like if you're working for a small company that you know has only a couple million rows of data, that's nothing. If you're talking about a really big company that has data in the billions or more of rows, uh, we can use one of Ottawa's local tech companies, can't call it a shining example, Shopify. How big do you think Shopify's databases are? Like the amount of stuff I've bought online that went through Shopify in the last three years has been kind of spectacular. Their data center, well, their databases must be kind of nuts. And the more duplicated their, their data there is, the more difficult it is to maintain data changes. Like I said, if you are changing a phone number and you need to change it in half a dozen places, there's a performance hit for that. It's going to make it go slower. If it's in multiple places, again, it's going to cause problems because you got to update multiple locations. And if you look here, you'll notice for each of the sales rep, you know, the sales office information ends up being, being duplicated across multiple reps. That's a bad thing because it means you've got to fix it in multiple places. So a modification anomaly is literally, I need to update in more than one place. Um, so that's a modification anomaly. An insertion anomaly would be, I need to add another person they happen to be working at the Chicago office. I'd have to copy Chicago office again. That means every single time we add a, a sales rep, we actually have to type in all the contact info. That's just dumb. And if we go back real quick to my table, right here, if we go and, you know, we discover that John Hunt's been... Uh, selling under the table and getting, you know, checks mailed to his personal mailbox. So we fire him and we delete him from the system. We are going to lose the fact that, A, the New York office exists. So we fire John and we lose the New York office outright. And we're going to lose the fact that, you know, Dell, HP, and Apple are customers. All in one go. Those are, that's known as a deletion anomaly. The slides in this case, um, are referring to it as, just as a modification anomaly. So in other words, you're modifying the data, this is a modification anomaly, but specifically there's an insertion, an update, and a delete anom deletion anomaly. That's the three kinds of anomalies that this refers to. Um, this term is the first time I've ever used them identified as just one glob. Bad. So there's the next one, right? The three types I just finished discussing them. So an insertion anomaly, which I just discussed a moment ago, is as follows. Let's say we want to add a new office, Atlanta. We can't add the Atlanta office unless we also include an employee for it. Why? Because the primary key is off the employee ID. 
Therefore, we can't add a new location without a matching employee. For what do we do? Do we take an existing employee, duplicate them, and then create the office? Hire somebody new, but they don't have an office yet. This is happening because the primary key is not available. Update anomaly, I just discussed that ad nauseum. Every time we want to change the phone number for Chicago, we got updated multiple places. And this basically is a series of examples that show an order item, some SKU data, and a SKU item data. And this is an order item, which is actually pretty decent. Uh, you got the SKU data, which shows the SKU, the description, the department, and who purchases it. Um, and then down here, you got the SKU item data, which has some duplicated data in it because it's taking from both. So if we take both of these and mash them together, you have one table that has, you know, less columns than these two combined, but you'll still have issues because you're going to be touching stuff in multiple places. So when we look at the product buyer, um, if a buyer called Nancy Meyer, right, which is the block in the middle here, is assigned a new SKU, what else do we need to add to this table? We'd end up, do we need to add one row? or two rows. And in this case, what they've done, which is kind of special, the product buyer, if you look at Nancy Myers, she has two college majors. So every single time we add a single SKU, we'd have to duplicate it. That is a duplication anomaly. In other words, you're going to add a, you're going to create duplicate data every single time you want to add something. This is a really stupid table, by the way. Don't ever do this. Um, So, which leads us to something called functional dependencies. A functional dependency happens when the value of one or more attributes determines the value of a second or a set of other attributes. So, the what a weird example. You know, I even read this earlier and I thought it made sense. Now I'm rereading it and it doesn't make sense. Based on the equations. Yeah. I'll come up with a much better example than that. I'm going to go back to this, actually. Okay. The functional dependencies, when we look at this product buyer table, the college major is dependent on the buyer's name. That is a functional dependency. In other words, College major belongs to the buyer. The SKU also belongs to the buyer in this case. However, because we have duplicated data, it's not a good table, but we have functional dependencies. If I go back to this one. Now, see how we got an order number here and a SKU and then a department and a buyer. The buyer so the department belongs to the SKU, the buyer determines the SKU, but the quantity, the price depend on the order number and the SKU. So these two are functionally dependent on both of these. These are dependent on only one of these. So that's what they're calling functional dependencies. It is functionally dependent on part of the data. So when you are defining an entity or a table and you define the primary key, the fields have to be dependent on that primary key. That's a functional dependency. So when you think about functional dependency, they're not, that's not math. So some people look at it, hey, it's an equation. No, it's not. Right, because of course, on the example over here, there, whoever created these slides decided that, hey, we're gonna use an equation as the example. No, it's not an equation. The functional dependency here is we've got 
a determinant called object color. The object color determines the weight and determines the shape. Therefore, object color determines both weight and shape. That's when you look at the slide, that's what the functional dependency is. In other words, weight and shape are both dependent on the object color, not on each other. That's a super simplified example, but you know it's much clearer than whatever that is. And a composite functional dependency, which is an interesting way of wording saying that you have an attribute that is determined by multiple dependencies, like dependent, dependent, like identifiers, I mean. So in this case, a person's grade is a combination, is identified by their student number and the class number. In other words, the grade for 8215 for each of you is functionally dependent on your student number and the course section. At that point, you can store a person's grade because we can identify it. So there's a few basic rules. So we have this cute one here, A determines B and C. So in this case, A is the identifier, okay? A determines B and C, therefore A determines B and A determines C, also known as decomposition. In other words, you take the full set of dependencies and you break it down into their individual pieces. If A determines B and A determines C, therefore A determines B and C. In other words, this. This one is the opposite. That one is known as the union rule. In other words, if you have a dependency based depending on an identifier and you have another dependency depending on the same identifier, you can put them together and it unions the dependencies. So the last one is if A and B determine C, that means that neither A nor B is able to defend, depend, define C. So C cannot exist unless A and B are both present. That's what that means. Yes. Eh? No, 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 no. This is actually just showing you how the dependencies work. The word, the terminology. Remember at the start, I said this is going to be an info dump. This is an info dump slide. So when you're talking about functional dependencies, there are three rules. When A determines B and C, that means A determines B and A determines C. Okay, so I'm trying to come up with a real world example. Your student number in Access determines your name, your phone number, and your email. That means that your student number determines your name, your student number determines your email, and a, your student number determines your phone number. That's what it's saying. It's saying it's basically student number defines name, email, and phone number. No, no, that's in separate columns. So in Access, your student number is your identifier. It's your primary key. That means that every piece of information in the, say, the student's table, I don't know what it's actually called, but let's call it the student's table. Every column in that table depends on the student number. Therefore, if your student number determines your name, phone number, and email, that means that your student number will determine your name. That's the decomposition rule. Now, turn going around and go, if a person's name, email, and phone number can all be determined using their student number, that means that student number can determine all three. That's the union rule. The last one is the, the one, the composite determinant, saying that C cannot exist unless A and B have both been defined. That's what that means. Uh, in other words, the compound key, if both values are not supplied, C cannot exist. In other words, again, going back to the grade example right at the top, if you are not 
if your student number is not associated with this section, you cannot get a grade. That's pretty much straight, as straightforward as it gets. Yeah. So the one where I was talking about the student and the grade. So, yeah, so with, you cannot receive a grade unless your student number and the section number are provided. Because I have nowhere to give you a grade. Like if in Access, there isn't an intersection of your student number and the section number together, I do not have somewhere to put your grade. Therefore, your grade for this class cannot exist unless both your student number and the section number are provided. Yeah, that'd be a bad dependency. Okay, so when we look at this table, we can see that the SKU determines the description department of the buyer. So the SKU determines all of these. The SKU description is connected to the SKU, the department, and the buyer, and the buyer is connected to the department. So these are the functional department the dependencies. In other words, the buyer is specific to the department, and the SKU determines all of these, and I'm not even sure what this is referring to. Apparently, the SKU description here is also determining other things, which is not how that table works. Um, but basically, this, 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 and this is dependent on the SKU. The buyer is dependent on the department, and that's how it goes. Um, dependencies in the order item table, uh, at least this one's pretty straightforward. The quantity, the price, and the extended price depends on the order number in the SKU. That sounds that seems a little difficult because that's a compound one. In other words, you cannot store the quantity of the price and the extended price for something that was bought unless you A, have an order number, and B, know what the product code is. Anybody here work in retail? Loblaws, Walmart, even Rotten Ronnie's will apply. You cannot, a person who, um, actually, we can go with Costco as the best example. How many of you have shopped at Costco? There we go. All right. You know how you can't buy anything at Costco unless you're a member? Okay. When you go through Costco and you create an order, the order cannot be created unless the customer is present for the order. There's a functional dependency for the order. Now, each item you add to your order as you check out is functional on the receipt number and the product ID, the SKU, barcode, whatever the heck they're using. So if you don't have both, you can't add the thing to the person's receipt. You go to Loblaws, you cannot pay for the bananas unless you add the bananas to the order. If you just walk out with the bananas, you're stealing. So in other words, we cannot store the quantity price and the extended price unless you have both of these. The extended price depends on the quantity and the price. In other words, you can't have an extended price unless you go out have the quantity and the price because you know it calculates it. So when are determinant values considered unique? A determinant is a unique is unique in a relationship if it defines every other column in the relationship. Let me reword that to so that it actually makes sense in an English sense. A determinant is a unique identifier that is defines the columns or the attributes for the rest of the entity in that every other item in that table depends on it. So going back to our student example for access, your student number is your unique identifier. It determines everything else in the student table. 
That means your, as far as access is concerned, your name is dependent on your student number. It's a unique value. It's the determinant. When you are looking at a table of data, you might not be able to find all the determinants for all the different functional dependencies simply by looking for unique values in a single column. Why? Because if we just go back to this example that we had, if you just look at the order number, you can't determine the extended price. If you just look at the no order number in a SKU, it still doesn't tell you what the extended price is because the extended price depends on something else. And basically, it must be logically determined. In other words, it has to be able to be determined something else. Okay, now, here's a table that shows some of the other normal forms. And we're only gonna worry about the first block for the rest of this lecture. This stuff here is pocket protector land. Uh, university professors worry about that stuff. Or, you know, data scientists worry about that stuff. So relations are categorized as normal form based on which modification anomalies or problems they resolve. First, second, third normal form and Boyce COD will deal with functional dependencies. In other words, they make sure that there's no insertion, update, or delete anomalies. Uh, you don't have to do uh, multiple updates for every time you change a piece of information, that kind of thing. Uh, fourth normal form is for multi-valued dependencies. In other words, if something is multi-valued, it should go into its own table. Um, and then you got data constraints and oddities. That's fifth normal form, DKNF. Uh, I wish I could remember what DKNF stands for. Off the top of my head, I don't remember. Uh, domain key and something else. Um, now, here's a little pro tip. 90% of the time when you reach third normal form, you're already going to be in Boyce COD. 95%, 98% of the time when you're in Boyce COD, you're already in fifth normal form. Just putting it out there that, you know, once you reach this one, often you're actually going to be reaching further down into these because those things don't exist in your data set. So, how do you, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm going to be going through them in a bit. Yeah, yeah, these are the different normal forms. So, first, second, third normal form, voice COD, fourth, fifth, and DKNF. Yeah, the source of the anomaly is the kind of problems it deals with. No, 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 it's just. That's what the definite, that's what they tackle. Okay. All right. So when you're normalizing data, you're going to read the business rules to make sure you're not breaking anything. Sometimes you won't even have them. But at least, you know, if you're given them, you should read them. Um, you do it one step at a time. In other words, you don't try to go a third normal form right off the bat. You go first normal form, second normal form, third normal form. You may want to draw a diagram. But here is what is important. This, these ones right here. You're not going to add any data. You're not going to take any data out. You're not going to create any new attributes. And you're not going to get rid of any attributes. So when you're going through the normalization process, the goal is that you will not lose anything. You may get rid of duplicated values because that's part of the process. But you will not lose any values. So if the office called Chicago is in there three times, when you are done normalizing, you should have one copy of Chicago. You're not going to lose Chicago. It just won't be in there multiple times anymore. You're not going to lose any attributes. In other words, part of the normalization process, you're not going to drop phone number. That's what that means. And Technically, the process should be reversible. In other words, if you don't delete any attributes, in other words, you don't lose any attributes and you don't lose any data, you should be able to go from third normal form and reverse your way back to first normal form because you haven't lost anything. Why on earth you'd want to do that, I don't know. But technically, if you can go one way, 
you should be able to go back the same way and end up where you started. It's a bit like when you build a puzzle, right? You put the puzzle, you put it together. When you're done, you can take it all apart, put it back in the box. Technically, you could take it and build your puzzle a second time if you enjoy that. But that's what this is saying is you end up with this nice, neat set and you could take this nice, neat set and make a mess out of it again in reverse order because you didn't lose anything. Now we're going to define the normal forms for you. Okay, first normal form. So in this case, information is stored in a relational table. Wow. No. It's called, I forgot to hit do not disturb. Probably spam. So first normal form. Something to be in first normal form. It must be organized in a table. A grid picture, an Excel spreadsheet even in this case. Each column contains an atomic value. In other words, each column only has one piece of information in it. So if I have something that looks like this, and I have that in a single column, these are not atomic values. This is a set of values. For an atomic value, they would be entered like Those are atomic values. In other words, you don't have multiple values shoved into the same spot. And there are no repeating groups of columns. Which means a repeating set of columns would be something like this. Um, Now, when we have that little example over on the whiteboard, and I really hope my camera can pick that up. So these are atomic values, but these are what's called a repeating group of columns. In other words, for Dan, we have three entries, and then we have Bob with one entry. So to make this be first normal form, actual fact. Let's go with actually not. I'm going to leave it like that, but I'm going to go. All right, I'm going to go grab my little pointer thingy while I stand here and go through it. So what I've got here, I've got a table, and this is technically in first normal form. We have a primary key is defined. In this case, it's a compound key. We have no repeating groups of columns, and the values are atomic. In other words, each inter each row is fully filled in. Each column only has one value in it, and we can actually pick out a specific row by identifying it by the primary key. This is first normal form. This resolves um, what's called a partial dependency. So, Or actually, that's not partial. Partial dependency is the next one. But this gets rid of the, well, it's not it's not a database. That's what it gets rid of, right? Fine, let me just put it back the way it was really quick so you can see what status that was in. 
So now I can, if I go like this, that's not in its normal form because I have a repeating bunch of rows, collection of columns for one row. Yes. It does to be in first normal form. There has to be an idea. Primary key is a relative term. It could be a candidate key at this point, right? So to fix this, at least to bring it into first normal form, we need fully defined rows. And we have a primary key and or candidate key, depending on which phrase you want to use at this point. If you don't actually have a database set of database tables, then they're candidate keys. If you're actually working with database tables, then they're primary keys. So that is first normal form. It's pretty straightforward in the sense of the row is fully defined. There are no empty gaps anywhere in the primary key. And there are no repeating values in any given column. So that's the first normal form. Second normal form. Now, second normal form is about functional dependencies, partial functional dependencies. And what that means is, let's just say I had one more column in here. Uh, what could I add on that to make it make sense? Um, So I've added one more column and this, I have a partial dependency. So I'm trying to grab a marker really quick. This is where I really wish I could uh, put up the screen and actually have more whiteboard. And the thing is I'm trying to make sure the camera catches it, which is why I'm stuck on that tiny little bit of whiteboard. So Variance is dependent on the whole primary key. So this is known as a partial dependency. In other words, this column only depends on part of the primary key. So we got a primary key that is compound. However, the version number only is only dependent on the skill. It has nothing to do with the employee. The years of experience depends on both. So this is a full functional dependency. In other words, it's fully dependent on the whole primary key. The version, on the other hand, is only partially dependent. Therefore, it's dependent on only part of it, part of the key. So I'm going to skip this alphabet soup here, and I'll just use this example. Okay. The, there's a student ID and activity that determines the activity fee, but realistically, the activity fee is only dependent on the activity because every student's going to pay the same fee for their activities, regardless of what they do, right? If you are going to go and join, well, back when you used to have to pay for the gym here, right now it's included with your tuition, congratulations. Uh, you used to have to pay to join the gym the crappy gym that's in A building. Um, every student paid the same fee. It, you didn't get different fees for different students depending on what your hair color of the day was. Therefore, the activity fee was dependent on the fact that you wanted to join the gym. It had nothing to do with the student number. Therefore, right now we have student ID activity determines the fee, but really the fee is actually dependent on the activity. So this is a partial dependency because the activity fee only depends on the activity and not the whole key. Just like this, the version is dependent on the skill and only the skill, whereas the experience is dependent on the whole thing. The third normal form can be said that the third normal form, it can only be 
but it's said to be in third normal form if, let me just finish dealing with this because I don't like the way they're jumping on that slide. Okay. If we have a partial dependency, how do we fix it? I'm just gonna go grab the little wheelie whiteboard because I'm running out of space. Think about that for a second before I move on. Because I'm pretty sure there's actually an example at the end of all the slides, which is really terrible that it's not actually being dealt with up front. That's so narrow. So when you have a partial dependency, how do you fix a partial dependency? You fix it by breaking up the partial dependency into its own thing. So if we had a person's in actual fact, that example is really bad too, but I was doing my best pulling it off the top of my head. Um, so if we know that we have the name and the skill determines the experience and the skill actually let's go with uh, version here too but we also know that the skill determines the version which tells me this is a partial dependence how do you fix it you'd break it out to its own thing so that the skill would be brought up here with the version. That's why I'm saying this isn't a particularly good example because you might want that set the version in there multiple times. Um, but how do you fix a partial dependency is you take it out of the original one, you break it down into its smaller pieces and you just keep breaking it down smaller and smaller. Literally that's what we're doing. So we're gonna just take it and decompose it into small entities. I promise when I do the example next week, my show, my it'll be significantly better organized. Um, yeah. Well, technically, it really, what this is, is it should be in here like this. And that one's self-determining because there's nothing else, right? So the combination of skill and version put together is the identifier. And the problem is now is the version would have to become over here, which is really bad. Uh, because then every single time you want to add a new skill, or add a new version, you're duplicating the value and skill, right? So you need to break this down to its own separate pieces. Honestly, when you're done, you'd be creating a bunch of synthetic keys to fix this. It's pretty much the only way to fix this mess. Uh, I basically exampled myself into a corner. I'll admit it right here. That I, I have an example I use for this that it's significantly better organized, but I don't have enough whiteboard to actually do it all. So I tried to keep it simple and I actually made it worse by keeping it simple. But essentially to fix something into sec, to make sure that it is in second normal form, we get rid of the partial dependencies, break them out to their own entity, and that's how you bring it. Yes. Yeah, that's what it means. So the examples that I used to use for this had to do with um, products and stuff. Um, you know what? what time is it? Do I have time to just erase that and start over? Yes. I'd rather start out with something better. And just so I can keep the examples straightforward, at least to explain the dependencies. Let me grab more colors. So many colors. I need a blue and a purple and a green. Okay. Let's just say I've got something like this. And I'd rather do a proper example then. Just keep regurgitating slides at you guys. Okay.
actually, let's do that. Okay, so this is not normalized. We're not even in first normal form because we haven't identified, there's a few different issues. One, we have a repeating group of columns, right? So you can see that these columns are found, but there's nothing next. Then both these columns belong to this row of data. You'd sometimes see this in a report. So sometimes you a piece of paper, sends emails you report, and you'll see Bob has these things on his order. Because they do it so that people don't need to deal with this. So now we don't have repeating groups of columns. And how do we identify what's in this order? Well, we can identify each row uniquely by the combination of SKU and the order number. Okay, fantastic. We're in first normal, we're technically in first normal form. We have a primary key, no repeating values, no repeating groups of columns. That's first normal form. Now, let's look uh, for our uh, dependencies. First things first, we're gonna look for fully dependent things. When we have the customer and the customer phone number, we can see that it's dependent only on the order number because we can see the SKU's repeated, so the customer's not identified by that. So, so far in this group, it only depends on that. Fantastic. The price, seems to be tied to the SKU. So then we have the quantity. The quantity is dependent on the order number and the SKU. So we know quantity. is fully dependent on the full key. But we have two partial dependencies. Oh, my markers are over here. Duh. So our partial dependencies are as follows. The customer number and phone are dependent only on the phone, on the order number. So that's a partial dependency. And the price is dependent on the SKU. Those are partial dependencies. Now, how would we fix this mess? Believe it or not, this one's a lot easier to, to fix to get it into second form. We get into second normal form by basically breaking it into its component pieces. And how do you do that? You take the partial and you move them out to their own entities. So we have, we have an order, which is determined by the order number, We know that. It also has the customer number. The customer phone. The SKU. And the quantity. SKU is also part of the primary key. This is why I said I don't have enough whiteboard. It gets a little gross. Now, the... So if you're starting to break it out, that's how we'd break out. Like, now there's, and then we'd have the product, right? Which is basically SKU and the price because the price is dependent on the SKU and entirely on the SKU. So let me go grab my red marker here to identify the full dependencies. And as it stands right now, I, I have left behind a,
This is fully dependent. We know the quantity is fully dependent on this and this, which suddenly leads me to think, hey, this isn't right yet. So this one isn't actually in second normal form yet. So I need to break it out. Why you roll? So I'm going to actually take this one, break it down again, get it quick, quick goes into the right normal form. So we know that we have an order number. <laughs> so we have order product. which has an order number, a skew, and the quantity. The order the customer name and their phone number. I'm just gonna abridge it a little bit. So when we look at it, now we know that yes are dependent on the order number. the quantity is fully dependent so right now our relations are now in second normal form we took that broke it down into three pieces so that there is nothing that isn't dependent on the entire primary key yeah now this is the steps you take while you're doing this yeah yeah these are the steps. So that was bringing it to first normal form. This is getting us into second normal form. So second normal form basically states to be in second normal form, it must be in first normal form. It's just like you can't be a super saiyan unless you're already a saiyan to start with. There we go. And then there are no partial dependencies. So in other words, any of the attributes that aren't a determinant, in other words, that aren't the primary key, are fully dependent on the primary key and not dependent on part of the primary key. This is second normal form. Way easier to understand this than the alphabet soup that they've got going on on the screen. All right, third normal form states, you have to be in second normal form to be in third normal form. You can't go from one to three. Well, you can, because you get lucky. But you are must be in second normal form, and that there's nothing called the transitive key. Now, notwithstanding the alphabet soup they've got going on on here, let me point out what a transitive key means. And I need another color. Currently, in my example, I've got one transitive key. The phone number is determined by the customer's name. I know it's a really terrible example, but the example I'm going to use next week is going to have more data in it. And the customer number is determined by the order number. So this is a transitive. In other words, the second you say that this value is determined by this value, which is determined by that value, in one go, that means you have a transitive dependency. In other words, to determine the phone number, you must transit two or more identifiers. So this one depends on this one, this one depends on that one. To get to the phone number, you gotta transit through two identifiers. Um, it's still not a good example, but it's way better than what I was trying to do earlier. Transitive dependencies is one of the things that a lot of people find the hardest to understand as part of the normal form process, is when do you know something depends on something else? Uh, if I had actually put in a, a customer number in this, it would have been obvious. This example right now is pretty bad because there is no customer number. Therefore, we're basing ourselves either on the name or on the phone number being the determinant. We could have used either of those right now. We could say, oh, the phone number is the determinant for the customer's name or the name is the determinant for the customer's phone number. It's a gross example, uh, but it just shows that there is a transition, transitive dependency. In other words, to get to either the phone number or the name, you must go through the other attribute. 
to reach it, and then you get to the primary key of that item. So how do you fix that? Let's just say I decided I was going to use the phone as my determinant, because at least the phone number is probably more likely unique than the uh, person's name. So the customer number depends on the phone, and the phone is dependent on the order. So how do you fix this? Pretty straightforward. You take this and you put it in its own entity. So we create a new entity called a customer. And it has a phone number, has a primary key, and a person's name. Now, in our order table, we get rid of this and just put in the phone number. So the phone number on the order is determined by the order number. The name, not sure what letter that was, but the name is determined by the phone number. So at this point, there are no more transitives. In other words, we got rid of anything that depends on something else to get its value. So, yes. Yeah, so the order has the order number and the phone number for the customer. The phone number determines the name of the customer and it's a foreign key, right? So, so in here, you can see that the order number and the phone number Phone number is determined by the order number because it is. The phone number is a foreign key because it's grabbing it from the customer. The name of the customer is determined by the phone number. That means that for somebody who lives at 613-555-1212 and their name is Bob and they decide that they're no longer Bob and they're called Mary, they only need to change the name in one place. Right? We don't need to change the name on the order anymore because if you look here, you know, if we want to make turn Bob into Mary, we have to update Bob twice. We have to update, you know, the phone number's fine, but Bob into Mary. And he's lucky, only needs to happen once. So the goal is of all this, these last, this brain dump I've been giving you guys, is literally um, trying to break things down so you only need to change things in one place. When we look at my example right here, if you need to change the price of something, you only need to change it once because then it's affected everywhere else. You want to change the quantity, you only need to do it in one place. Whereas over here, if I wanted to change that price, it would have had to happen in two places. If I want to change a person's name, it has to happen in two places. That is the goal of normalization, is to get to the point where you're changing things in only one place. Now, let's just say we decide to fire Bob as a customer. Right here, Bob gets fired as a customer. I know some of you have probably never heard that phrase before, but it's a wonderful phrase. Demarketed is another nice phrase. Uh, delisted as a customer is another way. Yeah, you fire a customer. So if we fired Bob as a customer, we'd lose the fact that SKU 101 existed, 299. Now in this structure, if we fire off Bob, we might lose the fact that Bob existed. <laughs> we'll probably lose the fact that they had orders and what they were, but we'll never lose the fact that we had that SKU. Fantastic. Let's just say we have a customer called Bob. And we keep, we're keeping Bob. We decided, well, nah, Bob's not that bad. So we kept Bob. And Scuba, we decided we we're going to cancel all his orders because Bob's a bit of a jackass and, you know, always reports everything as broken. So when you look at this here, you will see that we could delete the order, but we don't lose Bob and we don't lose the SKU. Why? Because they're discrete entities that live unto themselves. So that is the point of normalization. So 
all this alphabet soup on here is way easier explained like that. So, something to be in Boyce Cod. A relation in Boyce Cod is only in Boyce Cod if it's already in third normal form. And every determinant is a candidate key. So, in other words, for something to be in Boyce Cod, every determinant is part of the key. And so, there, here's our skew data table again. Um, if we want to take that table, put in Boyce Cod, we know that the skew data identifies the skew, the description department, and the buyer. So, this is in first normal form. There are no repeated groups of columns. There are no multi-valued attributes. So we put it in second normal form. So the SKU determines the description department of the buyer. Uh, the description determines these two. I'm not sure. I still don't know why that line's in there. Uh, the buyer determines the department. So it's in second normal form. There's Everything's determined by the primary key. So it's in second normal form. Pretty, pretty much what I had done there. And then we put in third normal form. I still just ignore that line. The data is this originally. The skew determines this. The buyer determines that. Uh, the skew and the skew description are both considered candidate keys. Why? Because the skew description could determine the skew or the skew could determine the description. It's a bit like the problem I had here with the phone number and the name where either of them could be the key, which is where, you know, this duplicated examples been living since the start of the slide deck. And like I said earlier, I re did review the deck, but it was I was drawing a complete blank as I until I started explaining it to you guys suddenly why they kept showing this one line. So in here, the skew could determine the description or the, the description could determine the skew. That's the issue with the voice cod situation. So the only non-key attribute is the buyer, and it's a determinant of the department, so it's not in third normal form. So to get in third normal form would be the skew, the description of the buyer, the buyer in the department. Um, so basically the buyer must exist in here. That's what it's saying. So now it's in third normal form, just like this was. Now to get this into boys cod is we have to accept the fact that the skew can determine the description or the description can determine the skew. And that means that every determinant is a candidate key. So in this example, um, both of these could be determinants. Therefore, they could both be keys individually from each other because they're basically put, when you look at the data back here, the skew and the description are unique unto themselves, right? So you could look up this description and find that skew or you could find this put in the skew and find that description. The descriptions are unique combined with the skew. So right now we've got this in third normal form. Fantastic. So if we want to get this to Boyce Cod, is we have to take uh, the SKU data, have the SKU, the description of the buyer and the buyer like this, and the buyer must exist in the SKU data. So we end up with this kind of setup where the buyer is here, but it has nothing to do with this other table that we had. Um, and honestly, right now, the buyer is dependent on both of these. And the way I'd solve this problem, just to tell you the truth, is either one of two things. Can anybody take a guess what the one of two steps I'd do to solve this to Boyce Cod? Because these these examples are really not that great. Can anybody take? There's two ways to solve this problem and turn this to Boyce Cod. Anybody want to take a guess? Absolute crickets, because your brains are melting. Option number one: pick one to be the primary key and only one. Right, that's option number one. In other words, we say, you know what? The skew is the primary key. That means the description is dependent on the skew. Congratulations, we're done. We just take this, blow it out to its own table, and say, 
problem solved. All of this table would have in it now is a skew in the buyer. Congratulations, problem fixed. That's option number one. Option number two, create a synthetic key, slap it in there. Give this a, again, these two would go to its own table. We would have a synthetic key and we'd throw the synthetic key in here. One of the perks of using synthetic keys is the moment you use a synthetic key, your invoice caught automatically. Synthetic keys basically voice caught you right off the bat. It's not always the right answer, but it's an answer. But the right answer in this, based on this data structure, is make the skew dependent, the description dependent on the skew, and that fixes it completely right off the bat. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. It's where it ends. And because honestly, when you look at it, the skewed off looks an awful lot like a synthetic key. It's just a series of numbers. So there's a 50-50 chance that those were synthetic keys at some point in their life. And um, this is a normalization example, which I said I wasn't going to do today, even though I pretty much just did one on the board. Um, because this is literally going through all these steps again. So as a summary of what's happening next week, I'm just going to turn off the screen because I don't need it anymore. Good. It actually turned off on the fifth press. Man, that microphone's really touchy today, eh? Next week, I'm going to go through this whole process using the right terminology without the alphabet soup that was on the screen. So what I would recommend you do, and I will do this. I forgot to do it last week. I will give you guys recommended pages from the textbook to read and give you the matching slices to go with it. Um, I'm also going to provide you with a plain English description of what normalization is. Uh, eh? Really? Wow. Sandra, the one that put the course material together actually used my document. Okay, good. I don't need to send it to you. It's already there. Um, just so if you guys are wondering what he's talking about. Come on. I hate that touch screen. In the course content for week five, there's a Database normalization is explained in simple English. It's as, it, as simple English as it can be. Normalization isn't really... I mean, she literally grabbed the slide examples from my document. So this covers all the things, all the steps, repeating groups, and all of the things explained in here. There are 14 pages on this document. It actually does a pretty good job. I've been told by students in the past, it does a really good job. Um, it just goes to show you what last time I actually looked at this document that I didn't realize that she was using my example in one of the slides. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll put this in the things you need to review for the week. Please read through this at least before next week. So this PDF, read through this before next week. And when I go through this process and hopefully I have access to the other whiteboard, somehow magically um that's what we'll do and that's it folks